We're going to talk a little bit about how the consumer time is spent a little bit more on digital marketing and how it continues to increase. Um, and so we've got together some experts here uh, to discuss some key trends um, for 2017 and beyond. Um, some of the stuff includes everything from how AI will revolutionize digital marketing, um, optimizing the customer experience through personalization, exploring developments in programmatic buying and selling, see you, Frank, um, and understanding the power of storytelling and, effect, and how obviously we can achieve that sort of stuff. Um, and obviously, we've got two fantastic experts on the panel here today. Um, first up, Victoria Pinder, uh, Director of Brand Partnerships of Europe for Playbuzz and Jay Stevens, Chief Revenue Officer at Adform. Um, each are going to give a 10-minute presentation. Um, we're going to obviously listen and enjoy it. Um, <laughs> I will ask some questions afterwards, and then I'll open it to the floor if there's time left for the audience to obviously ask some Q&A as well. Um, so without further ado, uh, Victoria, would you like to begin? Yeah. Have I got the... I think that's the... Uh, Perfect. The high-tech device. Brilliant. Maybe stand... This is a little bit easier. Brilliant. Hello, um, I am Victoria. I am the Brand Partnerships Director over at Playbuzz. For those of you who don't know what we do, we are a native storytelling platform. So I thought, what better way to spend my 10 minutes than to tell you a good story? It's not. Oh, so. We'll start our story in the 16th century with the article. Um, as you can see, the article was not that enticing back then. Lots of text, one big header, not very much imagery, if any imagery at all. Something else that existed in the 16th century, which I'm sure we'll all agree isn't really kind of relative today, Again, running water back then wasn't as readily accessible, which thankfully for us all, we have solved today, especially those of us in media from this shot. So moving back to the article, that's pretty much the same. When we talk about all this evolution, we're really expecting people to, um, you know, to digest and engage with content near enough the same way they did were expected to in the uh, 16th century. Even with the movement into obviously digital marketing and the digital space, as you can see, you know, the text, um, no imagery, you know, header, etc., is kind of just a direct replica. And we would say that that's kind of representative of about 80% of all uh, big publishers um, currently. interesting image. Um, so obviously, with all this lack of change, there's been huge amounts of change. Primarily, the way in which we consume um, content, you know. Content now is more about the user. Where does the user want to consume content? How does the user consume content? And how does this consumption really move into how they relate and understand content? Um, so. At Playbuzz, we feel it's time to move on from that, and we hope that our platform obviously facilitates for that. So it's time to adapt. How can we bring that content up into the 20th century and make users engage and interact more? So we would say step one would be more visuals. We live in a very visual world. You know, we say a picture says a thousand words, so let's integrate pictures more. Let's make pictures more an integral part of the story we're telling. And how do we bring those pictures together? Interactivity, get users being a part of the conversation, you know, get consumers, you know, working through that content, talking about that content whilst engaging with that content. And then taking that all into consideration, how are we going to measure the success of this content? How are we going to measure whether users are actually listening and reacting to the content that we're giving them from, from both a branded perspective and from a publishing perspective? So we really need to revisit those KPIs. Oh, God. There we go. Um, so this really sums up what we're talking about. And this was a report from the, uh, the New York Times, which, as we know, is um, a legacy uh, publisher. Even they have recognized in a report that they um, produced recently is that there is too much text. 
we need to you know, integrate more in how our users now relating and digesting content, and something in which I'm sure we're all interested in, how are users sharing content? What drives them to share that content? Obviously, we're going to be touching this on the panel today, but visual first content, VR, we can't ignore it. It's very important. It's really changing the way we think about things. But is it, we would argue, is it really something that is an everyday solution? A news line's just broken. Are we going to put on a headset? Think about, you know, think about yourselves, think about your parents. Are you just going to put on a headset to, you know, immerse yourself into that breaking story? We would argue not yet. This might be something for the future, but just not yet. So this is where the Playbus platform really steps in, providing both you know, publishers and advertisers the tools to break down content and make it more engaging. So by creating these bite-sized pieces of content, integrating imagery, videos, GIFs, quotes, mirroring kind of, um, you know, kind of ways of communicating that these users are used to and the ways in which they want to communicate. So these are a couple of examples, quite fast-paced, uh, of content which utilizes the Playbus platform to create that point of um, you know, interactivity. So as you can see, there's click to reveal, there's um, asking users questions, the text looks like a text message or a WhatsApp conversation. So really mirroring the habits of uh, communicating which your audience are used to. Making content more digestible, bite-size. Making it by making it bite-size, you make it more understandable. So again, going back to that report from the uh, the New York Times, our readers must become a bigger part of our report. And I think that comes down to creating that two-way conversation, getting them to react to that content and give their opinion and their perspective. You know, nine times out of ten, we relate most to content that we can actually touch that we can actually give our perspective on. So that's what we do at Playbuzz. We give users the opportunity, whether that's a breaking news article or that's a branded piece of content, to swipe, vote, flip. So it's those interactive tools that are just driving that extra bit of meaning by making them relate to that content, by thinking about what is actually being asked of me here, what is actually being talked to me about. So we can really you know, drill down into more engagement. So this is what we call engagement. I personally haven't fallen in a pool, but I have been known when engaging with these content probably to walk into a wall. So with all this in mind, how are we going to measure the success of this content? We've got people flipping, voting, swiping, sharing. How are we then going to say, that was a really suc successful piece of content. The user really un understood there what we were communicating. We would say that clickbait obviously is not the answer for that. Clickbait is very much about giving somebody a very enticing uh, title, and then actually when they get into the context of what that content's about, it's totally irrelevant, and they remove themselves from the situation. I think the current bounce rate is about 20%. Our Playbuzz platform really tries to eradicate that by giving users content that they actively want to engage with, and by making them physically engage with that, you're bringing it back to a point which we can measure. And that's what we do. We really break down the engagement of a piece of content from each of those individual particles. Which card did they flip? Which element did they respond to? Which bit did they read? And from that, we can really drill down to what pieces of content are most interesting to their audience. And from that, it gives both brands and publishers the opportunity to optimize that content. If we know users are really interested in you know, the first heading, the first title, let's optimize that further and build out a much broader understanding of who are your users, who is your audience, what is Johnny going to be buying in the next four weeks, how can we talk to Johnny in a way which he can relate to, which he wants to learn more about, and obviously from an advertising marketing perspective, that he wants to then invest his time and his money into. So what's next? Again, from the New York Times, I think this really hit the nail on the head for us. The internet is brutal to mediocrity. Mediocre content isn't going to fly in the current market. You know, people only engage with, consume content they're really interested in. People are time poor, and they recognize good content from bad content. 
And we would say that's why 13,000 publishers are currently using the Playbuzz platform to create content and then embed that within their own publishers and then distribute that at scale. As you can see, in all different styles, tones, methods, you know, what's right for one publisher or one piece of content isn't necessarily right for another. And that's obviously exactly the same with their audience. What's right for one person isn't necessarily right for another. <coughs> so credibility. I think good content speaks volumes. And obviously, some of these um, credentials really do for us. But I think what really sets us apart um, from a credibility perspective is obviously 500 million unique users um, per month currently engaging with content power, powered by pl Playbuzz, 40 plus languages, but I think it's really these benchmarks. And when working with both publishers and advertisers, I think it's these benchmarks that really set us apart. 85 to 95% completion rate on all content that's engaged. 5 to 10% share rate. I mean, obviously, that's very subjective as to what is that content about. And there's ways and means we can optimize to ensure a better share rate. But I think also the two to four minute dwell time, when you take into consideration that the average time spent with a piece of content is 20 seconds, two to four minutes is quite substantial. Oh. No? So the fact that you've even listened to me for Hopefully, nearly 10 minutes is quite substantial as well. Thank you. You all finished? Yeah, done. Fantastic. Round of applause, Victoria. Thank Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Victoria. Um, Jay, please take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you guys so much for, uh, for having me here today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, for, those, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, what Adform is and, and, uh, and who we are, we're actually Europe's largest advertising technology platform company. Uh, there's 770 of us, 350 code committing engineers, uh, based in 18 offices around the world, working on behalf <coughs> excuse me, of 1,600 advertisers and brands and agencies uh, that use our technology today to tell their story. So our story is that we build the technology and the software that allows you to tell yours. So, one of the things I wanted to talk about today really is, is kind of the rise of programmatic and actually some of its downfall and where it's actually going next. Um, because it has been a, a very, very, uh, I would say, turbulent uh, last 18 to, to, to 24 months in the industry. Um, consolidation is taking place uh, left, right, and center. I think we've had three acquisitions in, in, the, uh, in the Loom Escape just within the last week. Uh, so it's an incredible amount of, of, uh, of transition which is taking place in, in, uh, in the market. But I think the most important thing is while it might be in, a, in a, uh, a trough of disillusionment, we're rapidly moving to a stabilization and, a, and the market is moving to a spot where, uh, where the future is, is, is certainly much brighter and beginning to, to grow again, which is fantastic. And I'll, I'll hopefully we'll demonstrate some of that to you today. So in terms of what's next with programmatic, let's start from where we, where we came from. Uh, and what we mean by programmatic is the, essentially the ability for true one-to-one -one marketing. Uh, as most of you may know, media has always been bought or historically been bought on big tranches of inventory. Programmatic is a technology, uh, a set of protocols essentially that allows buyers to leverage their data to pick user by user, impression by impression, uh, media buys, and this leads to much, much greater uh, efficacy in terms of the way in which the media is bought. Most people don't realize this, but this was actually an invention which came out of Fox Interactive Media from the Fox Audience Network, essentially the people who built the ad server and the technology behind uh, the way in which MySpace uh, was using its, its, uh, its ad serving. And so it was gestated in this, in this essentially this lab in Los Angeles and quickly sprouted uh, over the course of the last five or six years and has rapidly grown. Um, but at the same time, you know, like any new market, there has been a raft of investment and a tremendous amount of, of fragmentation. Literally dozens and dozens of dozens of companies that uh, proliferate uh, the Loom Escape, the, uh, the, the, the very famous uh, ch checkerboard of, of logos that you no doubt have seen uh, when we articulate what, um, what, what is programmatic advertising. And it's easy to get lost. It's incredibly confusing. Who does what? What side are you on? Are you on the buy side? Are you on the sell side? Do you try to service both? 
Uh, and it's very, very challenging for both publishers that are, and media owners that are out there, as well as brands and agencies to navigate it. And it's <clears throat> part of the problem is, is that the market has created this problem, uh, just in terms of uh, the number of actors that are in there, some of which are very bad. And it's led to a whole number of challenges that brands have had with, with, uh, with the promise of true one-to-one -one marketing that comes with programmatic. So things like transparency, transparency of, of, uh, of rates, transparency of the supply chain of, of, of media, um, the, the tech tax that's associated with each one of these actors, whether they be data providers, viewability providers, the exchange itself, the buying platform, all, all, taking, the, all taking a tax along the way and leading to much less uh, of, the, of the investment going to, to working media. And so as a result, we've really seen this rise. I mean, Google and Facebook have, have really uh, been able to take advantage of the fact that because so much there is such a heavy tech tax, so much money goes into those two platforms because it works and it delivers. Um, and so until the industry as a whole can fix some of these problems, and it is, uh, it is going to lead to you know, more and more money and more investment going the, to, to the duopoly. Things like brand safety, understanding where my ads are going, what sites they're landing on. I mean, even, even Google and YouTube had a, uh, had a pretty big problem with this uh, just a few months ago and major advertisers beginning to pull out uh, of, their, of their spend on, on, that, on that particular media offering. Um, but regardless, technology will solve the problem. Like any new industry uh, that is growing, uh, there is the opportunity and technology will then remove those hurdles and those challenges. And when this happens, and it already is starting to happen, largely through consolidation and through the development of a number of uh, point solutions, it's able to solve uh, these issues and, and allow money to be able to, to pour back into to the industry. And you know, to this point, point solutions, you know, they solve the immediate problems, but then they begin to peak out and they begin to be consolidated. Even this week, my former employer uh, announced the, uh, the acquisition of a company called Intoggle, uh, which is a great solution for managing the proliferation of, of, of bid requests which come from exchanges. So Rubicon Project bought uh, Intoggle as a means in which to get in front of this issue and solve some of the problems, the infrastructure problems that are occurring uh, within the ecosystem. But they peak out, they consolidate, they merge into, into, larger, into larger entities. And another example of this is just yesterday, actually, uh, Seismic bought a company uh, called Rocket Fuel, which was one of the internet's, uh, one of the online advertising's uh, Wall Street darlings. It grew, went to a valuation more than two billion. They bought it yesterday for 145, actually less than their current market, uh, their share price. So an interesting, you know, interesting movements occurring in the industry is as everybody begins to consolidate to create full stack platforms of a DSP, a demand, uh, a demand side platform, a data management platform, and uh, the ad server integrated in, into one. But, and programmatic is, is taking over digital. Even with some of these problems, you can still see some of the numbers here. It's just incredible growth. Uh, in the US alone, there'll be $27 billion uh, in, uh, in, in programmatic spend uh, this year. Uh, so worldwide, somewhere around $50 billion of investment uh, is going into the space. And if you look at the advantages of social and search, they're inherently, uh, inherently bought, and, or media is bought on a one-to-one -one basis already. So when you, when you think about the overall digital marketing landscape and the investment which is going into the space, the vast majority is, is moving in this direction to be able to buy media on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and clearly continuing to grow at a very, very rapid pace. But I think the important thing here is that, you know, while programmatic is taking over digital, it's a methodology, it's not a channel. And I think what we hear from, you know, increasingly from brands and agencies is, well, programmatic, it's got all these problems, and let's, let's pull money out of programmatic. But that's not, the, that's not the answer, that's not where this is going. The answer is not to go back to the old ways and still send paper-based insertion orders and Excel-driven media plans uh, around for, for approvals. The, the, the opportunity here is, is to fix the challenge. And if we look at, uh, if we look at the, the you know, programmatic taking over digital, we've only just begun. Because the reality of it is, is that we still see, I mean, not in this country, but in the United States, we still see hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that is just being completely wasted on channels like broadcast. I mean, if you think about 
the amount of money that pharmaceutical companies spend to target drugs uh, or their brand to consumer, direct to consumer uh, marketing message that affects one in a thousand. So what's the, you know, in terms of it's not the, the, the famous Wanamaker, I know half of my, my marketing spend is working, but I don't know where the other half is. Um, I just don't know which half. The reality of it is, is in this case, 99.9% .9 of that marketing spend is being completely wasted. Programmatic solves that. And as we look to new channels, where do we go next? Really, TV, out of home, even print in some ways, can benefit from many of the kind of programmatic capabilities that are being you know, developed and evolving uh, within the digital landscape. So if we think that, that 50 billion global programmatic number is really only one-tenth of the entire marketing investment that happens uh, on a worldwide basis. So the opportunity to take the technologies that are being used and applying them to things like addressable TV, to digital radio, et cetera, et cetera, really opens the door for true one-to-one -one marketing. And that's really the promise of programmatic. And the future is incredibly bright in terms of where we go from here. So I know we're going to open it up for questions on the panel or after the panel. So I'll leave it at that. If you have any additional questions for me, uh, you can, you can uh, tweet us at, uh, at Adform. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. Excellent. That was both very interesting presentations. I think <clears throat> there's obviously a lot to delve into. And we can start by asking a few questions here. And then, as I say, we'll take it to the floor. And you guys can get your grilling questions there one by one um, with the time that we have. So yeah, we've got about 20 minutes still. So one thing that I'm quite interested in to know um, is the ad blocking. And it's looking at the, till the end of 2017, it's something that's going to exceed by 50% of the ads that obviously we get. Um, what strategy do brands take to ensure that this, you know, to, to deal with this sort of situation? Um, Victoria? Well, I think that's kind of where Playbus steps in because it that's we kind of facilitate for the increase of ad blocking because we're embedded like a piece of content. Um, therefore, we don't, that doesn't really affect us because it's not advertising, it's more a communication within the context of a piece of content. But obviously for, you know, strategies outside of that, then that is an issue. I think that's why you need to look more into the context of the actual conversation that users are having within the, within the content. Excellent. Yeah, I would, I would, um, I mean, we, 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 we've definitely seen the rise of ad blocking over the past few years, and definitely it's, it's uh, stronger, specifically on um, usually kind of the, the 16 to 24 year old male with a high gaming propensity, uh, where it tends to, to, you know, within that demo, tends to be a, a, a pretty, pretty big problem. And it's obviously affecting. Uh, a lot of publishers, you know, people like um, people like CBS, uh, Twitch, etc., that all have you know that, that target content for uh, create content for that particular demo. But I think in in a lot of ways, um, what it is doing is reducing the amount of available inventory that's out there. And in a way, that's not necessarily a bad thing because it creates um, it creates more. You know, with the with the demand remaining consistent and supply going down, yield naturally rises for for publishers. Um, yes, it does become harder to address certain audiences. That's true, but the reality of it is is that in the digital landscape, most publishers only sell 20% of their inventory direct anyway, and the the sell through rate, meaning the fill rate on the rest of that 80%, is usually only 25 to 30% as well. So. The, the reality of it is, is that publishers have a lot of unsold inventory that they, that they, can't, they simply can't sell and there's no demand. So really a, a drop in, in inventory levels isn't, isn't really the end of the world yet. I mean, if it continues to rise at a pretty severe rate, um, then there needs to be other solutions that, that come into play. Things like, um, you know, there's, there's people like SourcePoint and Content Pass um, <clears throat> that are looking to address this issue with essentially allowing consumers or mandating consumers buy uh, the, the articles that they're interested in on a, on a nano payment basis. Oh, interesting. And so, um, as you're saying, it's a, now it's an, it's an area where people have to engage, obviously, with this yeah. content a little bit more. It's yeah. something that people want to enjoy doing. Yeah. And that's obviously what you guys should be focusing on. Or yeah. Be focusing on. 
Yeah, so I think obviously there's a huge shift in the way in which people consume content as we just talked about. I think it's about, you know, Put, placing yourself at the heart of what are they interested in and how are they relating to that content. Right. I think it's also about being, um, you know, people being able to relate to what it is, the advert. So I think there was a recent um, ad for Netflix, actually, where it was a piece of content where it took the user on a journey in relation to um, a new show that they were launching. And I think it's very much about taking the user on that journey with them. They knew that it was an ad, but actually they respected what the ad was about and actually what it was talking to them and the journey it was taking them on. So I think it's making it relative to that, to that audience kind of avoids that also. Right. But for yourselves, you guys probably aren't blocked by, by no. Adblock Plus or any of the other. No, because we are the body You're of, the, part content. of the content. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think where, it's, where it becomes hard is for marketers looking to reach those demographics which are, are uh, increasingly installing ad blockers. Yep. Um, and so that's, that's ultimately their challenge, is, is how do they reach them um, without pissing them off at the same yeah. time. Absolutely. Well, yes, I mean, you know, per, from first-hand experience, I don't think I've ever you know, purchased anything or wanted to go anywhere yeah. through an ad that's just popped up. I yeah. mean, it just doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. But as you say, you know, people are reading relevant content. Mm. You, know, you want something that's yeah. engaging to that content, which engages you in turn. I think it's quality, not quantity, as well. Right. So if you're served ads that actually, as I said, that you can relate to, that are of interest to you, that do drive you to something. I mean, I work in advertising, and I do still click on ads every now and then, because I'm behav being behaviorally targeted. So it is something I'm genuinely interested in. Right. And I'm going to land in a destination that I'm genuinely going to engage in, or I'm going to purchase something. So I do think you know, it's quality over quantity. So don't serve me lo lots of ads that I'm not interested in for the one ad that I'm going to and I'm going to click. I right. think that, that counts and we have to take that into consideration. Yeah. Okay. So, Victoria, I mean, native advertising has been around for a while. Yeah. Um, and it certainly seems to be on a bit of an upward swing. Yeah. But so what new and improved sort of forms do you think that we'll be seeing over the yeah. next 12 to 18 months? I think that is so hard to think, even if we think about, well, for myself, when I joined Playbuzz eight months ago, so much has changed, it's ever changing. I think the key to keeping ahead of the curve is looking at consumer habits. Uh, I brought this up in a meeting the other day, but um, even thinking about my own personal life and my own mother, she said to me, I'm WhatsApping, do I have to Snapchat? I was like, have to is <laughs> not a word. If you want to, yes, but what are you going to do? So I think it's about keeping ahead of those habits. What are we used to doing? And then marrying that with what people are interested in. And I think that will take us, take us along. I think obviously I touched on it, but VR is a huge thing. I think it's going to obviously yeah. have a much bigger part to yeah. play. But then how do we make that more of a ready, available, instantaneous solution to that? Mm. Interesting. And do you agree? Yeah. yeah. No, I would, I would definitely agree. I mean, VR, I think, has a lot of potential, but it is questionable as... And it's still, still quite clunky. I mean, you still got to wear a headset. I'm, I'm personally waiting for the holodeck to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I tell you, I mean, it'd be nice contact lenses or whatever it's got to yeah. be. Um, I know. So, I mean, you touched on before as well about Generation Z, and obviously the visual generation is obviously we're yeah. just touching on now. Um, so, the current digital market mix. What do you think? offers the best option to achieve it. Would you say it's VR? Would you say it's this sort of visual sort of content? I mean, I know yeah. from my experience, you know, a video is easier to consume than it is just reading text. I mean, yeah. that's might because I'm a simple person, but you know, there's probably a number of people like myself. Yeah. So how do you engage with that Generation Z? I think it is about taking, everybody wants to come out of their actual reality every now and then mm. and engage in something a little bit different, create their own reality. So I think that has got so much scope, um, you know, and that is about tapping into new interest points and making it more accessible, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, you... Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, reaching that audience is, it's, it's a challenge, right? Because yeah. they are, they're distributed and, and I would say, I would say fickle, right? I mean, yeah. if you think about, you know, Snapchat, I mean, my, uh, my son who's, who's almost 16 has been on it, off it, on it again, and it, you know, the, the, what we see is that the audiences move, and if you look at Snapchat's numbers, their daily average uniques are really kind of what hovering about 140, 150, and they're beginning, the, the, um, the pace of growth is beginning to slow down, and slow down pretty significantly, they're plateauing. And that's a 
that's a pretty bad sign for, for a company of, of, of that valuation. Um, I mean, just to put this into perspective, those uniques are broadly the same size as, as what MySpace was at its peak. Um, and MySpace was generating about a billion dollars a year, just shy of a billion dollars a year in revenue. And um, Snap is, is well, well below that. Mm. So it's, it's uh, and, and burning a tremendous amount of cash uh, cool. along the way. So it's going to be interesting to see yeah. whether or not, you know, if, if the Generation Z begins to move away from Snap, um, and move on to whatever the, the, the next you know, platform is going to be that they like. Uh, it's going to have, you know, obviously, th impacts across the board. Yeah, yeah, I think what's integral is you know, maintaining their understanding of what part that platform or that, you know, that plays right. in their life. Yeah. If they start to not understand, well, how is that you know, enhancing my life or my communication, that's where you start to lose some what's people or if it peaks. From an advertising perspective, obviously with, with Snapchat, it's very much about association, not about the actual content themselves, because it's actually, you know, it's very much about that person engaging with that Snapchat and having that filter and then sharing it with their friends. From a marketing and branding right. perspective, it's not actually about that brand or that product or how that's actually going to enhance yeah. their life. I mean, but that's the thing, I mean, from what I've seen as well, I, I, for one reason or another, why Snapchat's got going the way it is, I mean, you've got, competitors I mean Instagram is basically doing the exact thing that Snapchat have yeah. offered for however long but they've incorporated it into a different system I mean, how do you see the competition working on that how does it you know how, how do you how does there a survival for the fittest in a sense yeah uh, how do you get to that sort of point well I think the the challenge is is that you know well Facebook in particular has got to get you know ha has to take their Instagram users who do tend to skew a bit younger uh, and migrate them onto the to the to the parent platform. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you ask you ask any 16-year-old whether they're on Facebook, and they're like, no, my parents and grandparents <laughs> are on it. Um, you know, it's not. You know, but they're on Instagram, uh, and so they you know they're going to need to to migrate uh, those people, you know, that generation upstream in order to keep to keep the growth. But you know, two billion two billion uh, uniques a month globally is a is a, is a hell of a feat. Yeah, absolutely. I know, I mean, it's probably the same thing. My, my grandparents are on uh, Facebook, so it is, it's turned to you know, a cooler level, which is right. Instagram, yeah. which not a lot of people really choose. But again, it's like engaging with that audience. It is Generation Z. It's quick, it's easy. You right. can do the dog faces, if that's you know, yeah. what you like doing. Um, but it is, I mean, how do you brand on that? How do you advertise on that? I mean, how do you get into those sort of markets? I think that's what's... Um, quite interesting and for the yeah. Generation Z. It is about creating that need. It's about creating that necessity for them to have to do that. Mm. I mean, I know obviously I'm resorting to my mum who's not within that, but she was like, should I be? Should you be? And I think that's the question with the younger generations as well. You have to be. It's like, well, why do I have to? And it's really about engaging them and, you know, putting that understanding is where does that cater for you? What are you doing with that? Is it about sharing things with your friends? Is it about talking to your friends? Is it about looking to be really, you know, really cool? It's about, it's about their egos, basically. It's yeah. about pushing mm. their egos. Yeah. I mean, and with Generation Z, it's not, you know, it, it's not so much the generation that's obviously, you know, working, earning that, those big bucks and things like that. So why is it that there's such a, a prime target? What is it that that why we want to focus on them. Are they trending mm. everything, you know, <laughs> bottom up? Because the money they do have, they will invest in. Yeah, the, exactly. <laughs> in I mean, the things that they're most interested income. in. Yeah. Maybe not huge, right? They're not yeah. going out and buying a, you know, $5,000 Chanel purse. Yeah. But, you know, they are, they do spend money and, and um, you know, especially on, you know, if you look at, you know, in-game uh, activity and in-game purchases, um, they spend pretty readily on, on, you know, jumping levels or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. you know, on, on, uh, on, those, on those applications. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, uh, it's an interesting world, isn't mm. it? Um, okay, so Jay, I mean, we've learned ev uh, uh, over the past se several years, I'd say, um, programmatic, it's really getting ahead and requires di like diving quite deep into data and information. Yeah. Um, so what tech innovations do you see on the horizon that will enable us to do that sort of stuff? Yeah, I mean, really what it takes to, to make that work is the fundamentals need to be there. And I think if you kind of look at um, the ecosystem today, it's largely being driven, you know, even still, by multiple point solutions. You know, as a, as, you know, a brand may have 
Adobe as their DMP, they might have Media Math as their DSP, and use you know, DoubleClick as their, um, as their, their ad server. Um, or some kind of varying combination of this. Um, and the, the challenge to really making uh, this, you know, to, to properly storytelling is that you need to be able to have one central location, one platform that is actually allowing you to, um, to craft the message, to set the logic in terms of, of how you are, are delivering what message and to what audience, um, and to be able to do all this in real time. So the ability to have you know, a data management platform, a DSP, and, a, and an ad server all in one. And, and actually, yesterday's acquisition by uh, Seismic of Rocket Fuel is, is exactly the path that, um, you know, and the strategy that we see this is going, because there's huge value add in putting all these together. Because when you do put all these together, you can then begin to apply machine learning and, and AI to the mix in order to ensure that that you're really delivering the right message to the right person at the right time. And I know that sounds incredibly hackneyed and, and it gets bantered around uh, you know, day in and day out and it's, it's, it's horrible, but the reality of it is is that what, what, we're, what we're getting to a point where we can do in, in digital media today, we've been doing below the line and in database and in email marketing for 10, 15 years. The ability to do dynamic content and deliver you know, a specific content block in a message that's tailored to you because, you know, might be shoes because you just bought the belt or the other way around, um, that is something that Amazon has been doing with email and most retailers have been doing with email for 10 years. Uh, and we're just now getting to this point where we can begin to do that within the digital media ecosystem. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. But when the market is fragmented with, with multiple point solutions, some of which don't talk to one another, uh, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to, to, to execute on, on these kinds of visions of being able to tell a proper story and to run a user through um, an overall uh, messaging curriculum. So it's not just, I'm driving, you know, I'm gonna hit this person with seven impressions a day until they click and buy. Right? It's about how do, I, how do I tell a message to this user over a period of time to drive them to the desired action that I'm, that I'm looking for. All the way from awareness to intent and all the way down through the conversion, but also not just looking at the conversion as the end goal. And this is one of the challenges I think that you know, marketers uh, have had in terms of the way in which they've worked with agency, their agencies in the past, is that they're kind of a marionette, right? Working with, oh, my creative agency's over here, my media agency's over here, that's in this country, and then I have a totally different set of, of agencies that I work with, here's my below the line agency. Um, and so it becomes, it becomes very difficult to get an overall communication strategy in yeah. place. And also not just to be looking at it through to acquisition, but then how am I cross-selling and upselling uh, those consumers and those existing customers, getting them to you know, increase the overall lifetime value that they, that they mean to me uh, and average order, you know, average order size that they have with me, but also how do I also begin to craft messaging where I know they might attrit or um, they're, they're up for renewal, how do I get them to ensure or ensure their renewal? So it's, it's all these kinds of um, you know, messaging, not just from not just through to conversion, but all the way through the entire customer lifecycle. Excellent. Yeah, it's pretty scary, but it's um, yeah. the way to do it, really. I think it's really important as well to make people feel like they've still got a choice. Yeah. Because I think, obviously, we do live in a very curated world, but I think, you know, what people love is still the, um, the freedom to choose and feel like they're discovering new things. Mm. I think if we feed people exactly what we think they want all the time based on their existing kind of you right. know, search, you're going to come to the end of the funnel where actually you've exploited all avenues. I think it's still really important to give people Serendipity. the freedom and the choice, exactly, the freedom of the choice of new yep. things. Yep. You know, out of the blue tomorrow, I might, might fancy buying a guitar, for instance. If you looked at my browsing history, that would not um, indicate that whatsoever. However, the fact that I would then, you know, browse around and have a look, etc. Right. So I think choice is really important in giving users, you know, consumers the opportunity to look at different things in a different way. Well, that's, you know, actually Mark Pritchard, from who's the CMO of Procter and Gamble, said it best. I think, you know, back in February at the at the IAB conference. He said, you know, we're basically pulling back some of our, our spend with Facebook because we've been targeting too specifically. Mm. We need to be able to go more broadly in order to, you know, get some of, you know, to, to bring people over and, and you know, reach some of the, you know, drive awareness and, and, um, of, and drive intent of, of people who are kind of seeing the ads serendipitously. 
Yeah, of course. I mean, that's how you want to feel, really. Yeah. You don't want to feel like, you know, gun against your head or anything like yeah. that to actually purchase anything or belong to anything. Well, that's when you will get an ad blocker. When it's <laughs> 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 Absolutely. So are you finding that um, brands are embracing technologies like or the future of technologies, like the AR side of things or whichever? Are they, are, are, are they really delving into those sort of areas of tech? To advertise to consumers. Well, yeah. we, we certainly do. I yeah. mean, increasingly, you know, if you kind of look at the ad tech uh, ecosystem, historically, the DSP, which is the demand side platform, and the ad server, the the decisions as to which ad server and, and DSP that a that a publish or that an advertiser uses uh, has largely been the domain of the agency, uh, who's make, making that decision on their behalf. And what's happened is really over the last 18 months is that brands have become a lot more aware of of um, of lack of transparency on, on a whole range of fronts, but really they want to know where their data is because the exhaust coming off of the ad server is incredibly valuable and it's an asset to the brand. And the brand wants to make sure that one, it's siloed uh, and not being intermingled with other advertiser data, but secondly, they want to ensure that and increasingly, and this is going to be a big theme for, for the rest of this year and next, is that they're, they're compliant with GDPR. Um, because that's going to have a huge impact because you know, now it's, while the e-privacy directive has been around for a while, it's 4% of global revenues is a fine for breach. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to make, make a big impact uh, for legal and compliance and having control over the software that they're using for advertising and, and display advertising or display advertising and marketing is, is critical. Yeah, I think we're, we're kind of finding the same. I think obviously when we move into the realms of our platform where you can create multiple pieces of content in different ways, I think it's been able to back that up with data is so important. Be able to give that, that, that audience profiling back and understand exactly what are the, their interests, where were they actually spending this precious time, I think has been quite important. And those engagement metrics that you that I saw on the dashboard, are you providing those to, you provide those to the publisher? Does the publisher have a, an advertiser or agency facing UI for them to be able to share that with? Uh, they have their own dashboard okay. for their own uh, publishing, right. um, obviously tools and metrics. And then from an advertising perspective, we give those metrics back. We, Perfect. We're working on a, um, for an interface for advertisers, but at the moment it's very much us. Giving it to them. Yeah. yeah interesting. Excellent. All right, well, um, that's all we've got time for. Um, it looks like our time is up. We've gone a little bit over. Um, I just want to say thank you, obviously, to Jay and to Victoria. Uh, you've both been fantastic. Um, I apologize, obviously, there's had not been much time to obviously ask any questions from the audience, but um, if the guys are okay with it, they're around afterwards, and maybe you, know, you can grab some time with them and you know, ask them whatever questions you wish. Um, thank you very much. Um, you've been a lovely audience. <laughs>